it seems totally normal to listen to a podcast about the Toronto Argonauts. It's the X's and Argos podcast. Welcome to the X's and Argos podcast brought to you by Funny Bone Broth. My name is Ben Grant, joined as always by JB. We've got the pregame walkthrough for the Labor Day Classic between the Hamilton Tiger Cats and your Toronto Argonauts. Coming up on today's episode, we're going to talk about some of the news and notes from a pretty busy week in the CFL and in Argo land. We'll talk about the Hamilton Tiger Cats strengths and weaknesses, plus our OCDC segment where both JB and I will give you from a coordinator's perspective how we would attack the Hamilton Tiger Cats. We'll get to what we both want to see and a score prediction. All that coming up on this episode of the X's and Argos podcast. JB, this is a big game. Labor Day is always big for an emotional reason. And I think it's probably bigger in Hamilton than it is for people in Toronto. However, this year feels a little different because it's hitting us early in a shortened season. It's only the fourth game for the Argonauts. This feels like a, a big deal, doesn't it? Uh, it is a big deal. I think this is a real measuring stick for the Argos. Um, they they beat Winnipeg. I think they've shown that they can compete at the top level in the league. And Hamilton is is rounding into form. I think it's a really uh, a really important measuring stick game. I don't think the result is particularly important, um, but I do think how well they compete uh, will give us. Uh, some good insight into where the season is heading. And I know going way back, this was a game that before the season started, I don't think either of us thought that the Argos would have a chance at winning this game based on the structure of the schedule, based on, you know, the Edmonton game actually happening, based on the Tiger Cats being a lot better than what they've shown to this point. But I'll be interested to see when we get to our last segment of today's show, I'm interested to see what you think is going to happen out there, what you what you predict as a score, because uh, I know I've already logged mine. I'm interested to see if you copy my score like you did last week or if uh, you come up with your own this time. Mm -hmm. So that'll be that'll be interesting for everybody. Uh, let's talk about some of the news and notes this week. So uh, we had the game rescheduled. So we know the Elks game had been postponed. Everyone had been wondering, are they going to cancel it, give Toronto the one nothing victory? Or will there be a way to reschedule it? They were desperate to reschedule it because it doesn't even it doesn't even work. Like especially for the Elks, which again, that's as long as it's not inconveniencing Toronto, and it, it really isn't. That's that's fine with me. But just from a football perspective, I think it's 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 kind of gross that we've ended up with the the Elks having three games in in basically like seven days. Uh, you know, I don't feel good about that part of it. Yeah, I mean that that's obviously borderline dangerous um <laughs> I, I think the league is is you know desperately hoping that this will be the only time that they have to adjust the schedule uh we'll see there's just no room like they can't make more adjustments this one adjustment alone and it was the easiest possible way to do it which resulted in a mess for edmonton schedule wise to the point where they had to actually make amendments to uh, how many players they can activate uh, Edmonton being able to activate more players because even the, the league looks at it and they're like, this isn't, you know, this isn't a normal timeline for, for three games. Uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. And so for them to reschedule a game and have this mess result and to have to change four different games tells you that there just isn't that flexibility, especially now as teams have used up some bye weeks, it's just not possible. So if this happens again, I can only see it resulting in a cancellation. But then if you're that team, you say, well, hang on. How come Edmonton didn't have to forfeit when they went through the same thing yeah. a few weeks I ago? I think the league has absolutely painted itself into a corner and they are, you know, praying with their rosaries every night that they can skip out of it. Because this isn't something like, I know they talked about last year in the NFL, they talked about the possibility of moving everything back one week if need be. You can't move the Grey Cup any further back. We're already into mid-December. You, you can't, we can't have like, you know, a Christmas yeah, Day Christmas, Grey Cup. Christmas Day Grey Cup. Let's do it. <laughs> I know. That's Love what it. we're heading towards. So Love you, it. it's just something that they have to, they have to, uh, you know, basically let every team know like this next time there's a problem it's it's a forfeit but and Edmonton gets away with a warning but that's just how it's going to have to be so the rescheduled game the way it looks is it's actually been rescheduled in what was 
Toronto's second bye week. So initially in the initial schedule, that last week of the season, that's where Toronto had their second bye. I was okay with that second bye only because it gave you an extra week to prep for the playoffs. But I, I think I prefer to have a game there. And certainly of the two remaining buys, one of which had to go, this is the one I'd prefer to be replaced by a game. We still get to keep that mid-season buy, which would be like September 30th, uh, you know, October 1st, that um, that weekend uh, where they're still going to keep their buy. And that's that's the perfect time for it. You're basically at the, the halfway point of the season. And then you go into that last stretch. And there are a few games that take place Uh, several days after the Argonauts play their last game still. So I actually think schedule-wise it works out okay. It is tight though. You look at those last few games, you've got October 30th, that's when the Lions are in town. Six days later, Toronto's at Ottawa. Six days after that, Hamilton's in for their last visit. And then four days after that, is where the Elks come in to do that rescheduled game. Uh, I mean, my, my hope would be that, you know, Toronto by week 17 has in the number two st- spot, you know, locked up. And, and then this game is basically just an exhibition. None of this number two spot locked up anymore. That was preseason talk. Now this is the number one spot locked <laughs> well, up. That's what we're hoping for I, I for that we'll, last week of the season. We'll see come my prediction. But uh, yeah, that's a tight stretch for them because they've got four games in, I believe, 17 days, which is and not as tight as, as three and seven, but it's it's still a pretty busy uh, last four uh, games of the season. So yeah, and that that Hamilton game may may mean something important. That last Hamilton game on November 12th may be about one and two. We'll see. There's a lot of seasons still to play. But uh, these these four games against Hamilton are they're about seeding, they're about you know standings. They're they're probably not going to decide playoffs or not. I think I can say with some confidence that both Toronto and Hamilton are going to be in the playoff picture. I don't think there's just the way that the league is shaping up. I know we're only a few weeks in, but I don't think there's any scenario where we're going to find. Hamilton or Toronto is on the outside looking in, but I do think all of these Hamilton Toronto games will be about seeding. Let's talk a little bit about some of the I, I you know I hate to I hate to look down our schedule and see COVID topics, you know, week after week. I know people are getting burnt out about it, but it is a big part of what's happening in the league and it did affect the Argos this week. Um let's maybe talk about the vaccine policy first. So MLSE this week released an updated vaccine policy that will kick into effect September 22nd. And where it's different from what they had initially planned is that there is no longer going to be room for negative tests as a replacement for the vaccine. So for that September 24th game where the Argos are hosting the Alouettes, the only people allowed into the stands will be fully vaccinated. You can no longer get in by presenting a negative test. JB, what's your thought on this adjustment? I, I think it's, it, it makes a lot of sense. I think that that's where society in general is heading, some some parts faster than others. But, uh, you know, I salute MLSE for having, you know, uh, you know to, for having more courage than our elected officials. Yeah, that's well said and interesting to think about too because it's not something that they're doing because they believe it will lead to more attendance. They're not doing this because they think, well, this is going to have people rushing out to the game. They're doing this for health and safety. And I applaud that move. I think it's great. I think it, it makes, it makes sense. And that's where the CFL is sort of trying to get to. We've now got every team on board with, uh, to some degree, allowing only, uh, vaccinated fans or, um, in most cities, uh, people with negative tests, but clearly, with the incidents that have been talked about in the past two weeks with Edmonton, the league is making a push for it. We still believe that the charter flights are going to be an issue for all CFL teams. So this is just something that makes sense. And of course, September 22nd, this is when you're getting into hockey, your basketball approaching, and they want to go forward. MLSC with all of their all of their entities, they want to be able to go forward with a plan that they feel comfortable with and that their fans feel comfortable with. So it's more about more than just the Argos, obviously. 
And and I think that leagues have seen what happened in the CFL and the NFL. And increasingly, if you look at the NBA and the NHL regs, leagues are no longer screwing around. You know, the NHL has come out and said that essentially you can fine a player if they're unable to travel or unable to play. So I think that leagues are realizing that, um, you know, that just hoping people will make an intelligent decision is not uh, the path to take that, you know, we, you need legislation, you need rules, you need to force people to, to do what's good for them, unfortunately. And COVID did get a little closer to the Argonauts this week. There were three players that have been held out of practice all week due to COVID protocols, Philip Blake and Darius Bladek along the offensive line and Ricky Collins Jr., a wide receiver, all three starters, uh, which is a big deal. You know, having seen a few practices this week, the Argos had to scramble around to, to you know, have guys step in. And, and their status for the Labor Day game is still uncertain. I'm optimistic that, you know, it's just trying to read between the lines and, and trying to make some sense of what we've been told, which is a fairly limited amount of information we've been given. It sounds to me like the team is expecting all three players to be cleared to return to practice at some point on the weekend. Maybe that means tomorrow, Saturday, maybe that means Sunday. But it did sound to me like that was the expectation. However, if not, they have been getting reps for their replacements all week. So the receivers have been rotating through, getting more getting more looks to replace those Ricky Collins Jr. snaps. And we've seen Shane Richards and Dylan Giffen getting a ton of snaps at guard just in case these guys aren't able to go. And then you've got the question of, well, will they even be ready to go? So if they are cleared for Sunday, can those three guys step in? So much new stuff gets added every week. Have they been able to, to um, you know, I'm sure mentally they're aware of what's happening, but it's not the same as repping something on the field. So, you know, how confidently will the coaching staff put them out there and believe that they'll be ready to go for Monday if they only get to practice on Sunday, let's say? No, that that definitely is going to factor into my prediction. I think it's it's a big loss. I think that you know all things being equal, I I like the Argos against Hamilton, but you're not going to beat Hamilton in Hamilton without all hands on deck and ready to go. And the last thing that we want to cover in terms of news and notes from this week was there was a, a weird little stadium issue that they had. So the team is practicing at Lamport Stadium, which is a really short bus ride from BMO Field where all of their facilities are. But there was some new advertising that was put in, uh, I believe, at the beginning of the week. And it's at, right at center field. It's this big rectangular Toronto Parks, Forestry, Recreation uh, sort of field banner. And we saw some coaches walking over that area on Wednesday's practice, kind of looking at the seams as though there might be some sort of a, a safety hazard there. And lo and behold, the next day, they practice at Centennial Stadium, where they don't have to deal with uh, adverse field conditions. They're back at Lamport Stadium today, but it still wasn't fully fixed. There was a crew there trying to make repairs uh, and trying to make it safe and, and playable, but it was something that practice had to work around. So you imagine a full football practice from start to finish, not having access uh, to that uh, middle of the field area. It makes it very difficult. And so that was just one more thing thrown at the Argos this week. I thought they handled it fairly well, but it was just one more inconvenience to to have to deal with in what is shaping up to be a pretty important week. Yeah. I mean, you say crew, the one guy. I mean, come on, city of Toronto. <laughs> Like, One guy with a lot of equipment. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that guy trying to get it done, but you know, the, they needed to they needed to send more people than that to try and get this field, you know, playable for a professional football team. I, I agree. I thought that they you know they adapted well as as uh, you know as an organization, but it, it wasn't optimal in terms of being able to practice uh, longer routes. They they you know it was it was hard. It was good to see that the mood had really lifted because Wednesday's practice was not, it wasn't one of the best practices of the year. It was odd. It just felt strange. Everything felt off about it. And maybe that was because you had three starters missing. Maybe it was, 
you know, just having having missed a week and people getting back into the swing of things. And that was following an off day as well. But something felt weird about it. Today, it was a far more positive thing. We had, uh, you know, tunes from Drake's new album uh, blasting through the stadium too. And I think that really lifted everyone's spirits. So it just seemed like a form, far more positive place that the Argos are. Uh, we're in today approaching this game with Hamilton. Yeah, agreed. I thought the, I thought the team looked loose and confident and uh, you know so i i was actually really happy to see that i think it it had it had the vibe of a team that uh, you know that's confidence is probably the wrong word it, it it felt like a team that felt comfortable and confident in their talent um so i thought that was really good to see a few moments of levity this week at practice what was your favorite there are a couple of good ones to choose from um it was fun seeing uh, the the DBs teaching uh, Josh Haggerty how to dance. Yeah, yes, I thought that, that was, was you know I thought he picked it up pretty well. Uh, that was not amazing. Bad. So I thought that was you know some some good uh, unit cohesion. I think my favorite was probably the break dance contest that uh, suddenly appeared out of nowhere between Declan Cross and Boris Beatty, which you probably wouldn't if I said two Argos were involved in a break dance contest, you probably wouldn't have instinctively said oh. I bet it was Boris Beatty and Declan Cross. And then who was the official for that uh, for that break dance off? It was uh, special teams coach Mark Nelson, which again is probably the last guy that you would peg as being the person to evaluate that uh, <laughs> that break dance contest. Yeah, that was I, I amazing. thought Cross won going away. Oh yeah, Cross was amazing. Boris Beatty did this amazing backspin into like a lying down, resting your head on your hand pose, which was cool. But then Cross just came up with this like full routine. He looked like a million bucks. It was it was amazing. I don't think it was even a contest at that point. All right, let's move into Hamilton's strengths and weaknesses. For Hamilton's strengths, uh, I guess it, these kind of almost go together. Like you know what. What isn't good about the Tiger Cats? Like, why haven't they produced, um, you know, more positive results? Because their game last week, and I I think probably a lot of Argos fans watched that matchup last week between Hamilton and Montreal, it being an East Division affair, and Hamilton looked dominant. So what is it about Hamilton's strengths that stand out to you? Well, I mean, the team clearly uh, was unified behind uh, Dane Evans taking over at quarterback. I'm not sure what, you know, what precipitated that feeling, but they certainly look like they had their swagger back against Montreal, um, you know, from from a tie cap perspective. Uh, th- defensively, they're really impressive. I think that their, you know, their their secondary is healthy. They fly around the field. Um, their D line is stout against the run. Uh, they, you know, they looked they looked great defensively. Uh, they looked fine offensively um not not terrifying um brandon bank still has not shown up this season i'm not sure i'm not sure what to make of that i think that that's a concern heading into monday that he has yet to have a huge game and i'm sure hamilton is looking to to get him going um you know they they look like a good team now now having said that you know montreal played them much tighter than the score showed and really it was just a terrible vernon adams pick um, that turned that game upside down uh, in the fourth. So they looked better, but they didn't look like last year, you know, or two years ago's tie cats. You know, they look, you know, I think I think that the Argos are still able to um, to beat them. I think all things, you know, all things being equal. Here's an interesting thing. When I was thinking about like what you were saying, would you feel more comfortable playing Winnipeg? You know, have, we've seen them a few weeks in a row now, or Hamilton. Who's who's the better team between Winnipeg and Hamilton? Mm. I know I know they played head to head and Winnipeg won easily, but that doesn't always mean anything. Yeah, I don't I don't know what got into Hamilton on those road games. Um, I think Winnipeg's defensive line is better. Yeah. Um, in terms of in terms of um, pass rush. Um, and, uh, I, I think that Calaris is, is a better quarterback than, than Dane Evans. I don't know. Uh, just, just don't get me wrong, but just, um, but I think Hamilton's secondary is better. Um, you know, I think they're very close, I guess is what it comes down to. I would, I would say, um, 
you know, I would rather play. Um, uh, I, I, I I would put them almost equal to each other. In, in all honesty, I, I, Hamilton doesn't scare me offensively until I see Brandon Banks be Brandon Banks. Now, if he if he returns to form, then it's a problem. But if if he is not a game breaker, I I don't think offensively they're any scarier than Winnipeg is. I do like the fact that I know full well that Coach Young is aware of Brandon Banks. You know, he's been around long enough to know exactly what he is, what threats he poses. And he was part of the coaching staff that, of course, you know, schemed for him last year. And so they're very aware that, you know, he's been beaten by Brandon Banks and he has beaten Brandon Banks and, you know, shut him down fairly well at times too. So I'm excited to see what he has in store because the Argonauts have had a pretty good defensive game plan every week of the season and it's been different each time so I'm excited to see what they come up with that will continue to keep Banks at bay but also you know take advantage of some of the weaknesses which I guess we'll get into now and for me what I saw from Hamilton going over the the three games that they've played I think they have one clear weakness. Not every position group is a strength per se, but they're at least fine at every positional group except for offensive line where they really struggled. And I think that is the one weakness that has affected almost everything else, even their defense, to a point where their defense gets put in a position where they know they can't afford to take risks because they give up points and then suddenly they know their offense you know, can't, uh, can't account for that can't come back, uh, you know, in a trailing position because uh, the the line just takes down their entire offense. It doesn't give them time to pass. It doesn't open up run lanes. Their quarterbacks are getting hit. Even last week, Evans looked better, I thought, than, than Masoli, who was under heavy fire in those first few weeks. But he still got hit a ton last week. They couldn't protect him. So it's not like they fixed the problems. Yes, they won the game. But like you said, it wasn't they still only had like 10 points you know, fairly late in the game. So it's not like they ran away with things and the offense was clicking. So I think all of their problems stem from that offensive line. And so that's something that Toronto is going to have to expose. Yeah, I, you know, I think, and I think that's something Toronto can expose. I think that we have, you know, we have the talent on the, on the defensive line and we have the talent in, in the secondary linebacker from a blitz perspective to, to start throwing, uh, you know, start throwing a lot at them. I think that you you want to test that line, and I think that that is definitely the the pivot of of the entire game. If 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 they can get to the quarterback at the rate that Montreal did, um, I think Toronto is a better team than Montreal, and uh, and we can get a result. And and like you say, Hamilton is so good defensively. You do not want to get behind to them. Um, because that that secondary is ball hawking. You you do not want that secondary knowing that you are passing. It's funny because we say that the offensive line is is their weakness. I would have thought coming into the season, if you said to me, Hamilton's offensive line is struggling, which quarterback will look better in that scenario? I would have thought it'd be Jeremiah Masoli. I would have felt like he would handle that that better. But I think it has been Dane Evans. He's hung in there, and I thought. On my preview this week, the scouting report that I ran with Marshall Ferguson, something he said that I thought was interesting when he compared the two quarterbacks, he talked about them both having similar ceilings, but the biggest difference between them was that Dane Evans has a much higher floor. So when Dane Evans has a a bad game, it's still fine, whereas Masoli can really fluctuate between having huge games and, and terrible games. And last week, even though he was heavily under pressure, Dan Evans didn't, you know, he wasn't throwing, he wasn't throwing horrible interceptions. He wasn't fumbling the football. He was taking hits. He was, you know, there were two and outs, but it, you know, there, there weren't disasters that came from that. And so I think that's something the Argonauts are going to have to now try and turn around. They're going to have to make, force Evans to make mistakes, uh, force them to have to, you know, play a different style game than they want to play. Uh, force him to make throws faster than he wants to make them or continue piling up those two and outs. That's fine too. But I think they have to make him uncomfortable. Now, the question is, do you do that with a three-man rush like we saw a lot in Winnipeg? Or do you do that by sending the house, which I, I think would be risky, but interesting. 
And that ties us into our next segment, which is OCDC. In this segment, JB and I will play the role of offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator for both the Hamilton Tiger Cats and the Toronto Argonauts, one after the other. So let's start as Hamilton. If you are approaching this game as the Hamilton Tiger Cats, you're the defensive coordinator, I'm the offensive coordinator. What is your defensive game plan in trying to shut down this Toronto Argonauts offense, JB? Yeah, that's a great question. I think if I'm if I'm Hamilton, I'm looking at a couple of things. I think number one, if they're missing two starters off the offensive line, then I I absolutely send heat to see uh, whether they have plugged those holes or not. So you know a lot of heat early, um, you know linebacker heat, secondary heat. Um, so supposing Toronto is able to to get through that. I think that you're you're definitely want to uh, to focus on the running backs. I think that's what blew Winnipeg out that they weren't able to stop the two back set. Um, I think you're you're really looking to stop the run um, because with the secondary I have in Hamilton, um, I'm gonna trust my guys to be able to um, to be all over that quarterback in terms of pass coverage. I don't think that they're gonna need as much help. So I'm, I'm loading up to stop the run and I'm going to dare Arbuckle to beat me deep. I'm going to sit on those underneath routes and we're going to pick them or we're going to hammer dudes who catch them. And we're going to stop the run and say, Arbuckle, if you can beat me on a 40 yard pass to your left, then I'll take my hat off to you. But I don't think you can. And on the other side of the ball, as the Hamilton offensive coordinator, I'm trying to go deep. I want big plays. I think that's where the room is for Hamilton because the Argonauts defense is is strong. There's no getting around that. I think the Argonauts defense is going to be able to stop the run. I don't see a lot of space for Sean Thomas Erlington. I don't think he's going to have the kind of game that he had against Montreal. I think it's going to look a lot more like it did in, in the first two games against Saskatchewan and Winnipeg. And so I, I don't even know if I try to run that much. I don't. I don't think I even try to keep them honest with that. I want to take big shots. I want to get Brandon Banks involved and hope that he can break one early, that he can take advantage of a missed tackle. And I really want to take deep shots uh, down the sideline and see if I can stretch the defense out a little bit. And maybe that will start opening things up. Maybe that will start opening up the run. Maybe that will start opening some of those quick slants and and crossing routes to Banks uh, that he can maybe take the distance. And I also want to see what kind of attention Toronto is paying to Banks. Because if they're overcompensating desperately trying to keep him off the stat sheet, then I'm going to try and scheme to use that to my advantage. And I'm going to create some misdirection, that quick pump fake on on a quick screen to Banks and then go deep, things like that. Uh, and so that's that would be my plan coming into this game. But I think for Hamilton to win this game, I think they have to hit a couple of big plays. I think at the end of this game, if we look at the scoreboard and Hamilton is on top, I think what has happened is the Tiger Cats have cashed in on at least a couple plays over 40 yards and that's where the majority of their points have come from i just don't see this team stringing together a lot of long drives with short passes and running plays and so that wouldn't be my plan coming into it as the hamilton offensive coordinator all right let's switch teams jb now we are on the argonauts what is your defensive plan for the double blue taking on hamilton yeah, it, it, as a Toronto defense, I, I think that we can play Hamilton head up, straight up. I don't think that you need to be that exotic. I think that from a player-to-player um, angle, w- uh, we don't need to necessarily throw tons of blitzes or do anything special. I think that that our players are able to to defend, um, you know, against Hamilton. I don't I don't think we need to load up on something to stop it. I think that we are good against the run. I don't think Hamilton is particularly dangerous on the run. Uh, I think you roll in some double teams on Dunbar, who's shown that um, you know he can go out there and catch that uh, the sideline pass. Um, and he's he, you know he's got decent hands, and he is certainly a guy the quarterback is looking to go to to get into a rhythm. So I would double Dunbar a lot, and you know, and, and basically dare them to, to beat us with, with banks. And look, if banks crushes us, 
you know, so be it. But I, I don't think that we should prepare for banks based on past history. Those, those first three games, he, he doesn't look like that guy. So that's what, from my perspective, I think that we can play them straight up. We don't need to be cute or overload or try and fix holes. I think that we can line up with Hamilton and, uh, you know, and, and play ball, which which is a great place to be as a defense when you have that ability. Your plan makes me really nervous, like just leaving leaving Brandon Banks alone and say, oh, I'm sure we'll be fine. And I don't know. I think those are hard throws. Like it'll be interesting to see this defense because we haven't seen the Argos play against a quarterback who will take shots to the sideline on the field side. Those those really deep passes. We just haven't seen a lot of that. You know, Bo Levi Mitchell didn't really do that in week one. And, and Zach Caleros doesn't really do that. He's far more likely to throw to the boundary side. And so it'll be interesting to see how this defense manages with a field that is stretched out a little bit more horizontally than they've seen so far this season. So I'm curious about that. But man, your plan I, is exciting. It makes me nervous, <laughs> well, though. I mean, in a sense, it is. I think that it's really pretty conservative. I think we're on the road and we're playing Hamilton. Um, and we, we, we don't need to get that crowd, um, fired up. So I think that anytime you try and do things which are a little more exotic, it's always, you know, risk and reward. And I think that, you know, I I think a very kind of conservative, keep everything in front of you game plan is, is the one I would choose, um, for this first of the back to back. I feel like man coverage against Brandon Banks is exotic. (laughs) <laughs> well i'm i'm look man maybe sometimes guys sometimes you just drop off a cliff we'll see we'll it's see true, sometimes, it has been some sometimes time. guys guys you know that half step that made them elite um sometimes it just goes like you know like night falling and that might be the case you got to be ready for an adjustment though because well you if, can't adjust if, age no, I, I just mean like early in the game as a defensive adjustment. Like oh, if Banks mean, comes oh, out suddenly, and suddenly he is Brandon Banks. Well, yeah, and then we're like, oh, then, then, man, I wish you know, we had a plan for that. You know, then you, you know, <laughs> then you, you know, you, you go we, back you to work, and I'll, you know, I'll see you in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. All right. Well, my offensive plan for the Argonauts is to use Hamilton's film study against them. They've had a lot of time this week in prepping, not as much as the Argos, but it has been a long week. There's been a ton of film eaten by the Hamilton defense. There's no question. They've got Foster on their minds. And so much like we saw with Foster being able to take advantage of Winnipeg planning for John White, I think there might be a little bit of that this week where they're going to be trying to stop Foster. I think that maybe opens the door a little bit for White. We saw the Argos use in that second Winnipeg game a number of snaps where both Foster and White were on the field. What was interesting about those is that Every single time Foster and White were on the field, one of those two backs ended up with the football in their hands, whether it was a running play or through the air. Hamilton is no doubt picked up on that. And so I want to use that against them. So I would like to send out both backs, play action, maybe a pump fake to Foster, leak him to the flat, go deep, something like that, where it's going to take what they're planning for, take what they're game planning for and turn it on its head. So... I might use them in sort of misdirection that way. I do, however, think you can still get them involved in the passing game once you've sort of convinced Hamilton that, okay, it's not going to go to them every time because I do think there's a, a matchup advantage there. I like Hamilton's corners. I like I like Hamilton's defense in general. There aren't really many weak spots. I do think if we can find a way to get the running backs with the ball out in space, uh, whether that be through wide runs, through screen passes, through... Uh, check downs, late leak outs, which I like, um, you know, it sort of have the same effective screens, I guess that kind of thing. I, I would like to get the, the ball into the running backs hands that way. But the other thing I, I think the Argos can take advantage of is some of that, that sort of middle depth stuff that they haven't really shown a ton. I'd like to get, I'd like to see Eric Rogers downfield a little bit more, um, Take advantage of the middle of the field, especially if they're going to give it up to come and stop the run the way that Winnipeg eventually committed to doing. If they're going to start bringing safeties up, if they're going to start bringing run support to really take away Toronto's run game and try and have Arbuckle beat them, 
then I want to see I want to see deep posts. I want to see smash concepts where we've got corner routes and man coverage because those are throws that I feel Arbuckle can make quite comfortably. So that's sort of as the game develops, I guess what I want to see. But it starts with using some deception with those running backs, playing off of Hamilton's own film study and going against some of the tendencies that Toronto is very aware they have. I think that's the nice thing about Coach Dinwiddie. And when you watch Calgary from 2019, it's the same thing. They're great at adjusting week to week such that when you think you see something that you saw in film from last week, it's actually the opposite of that. And they're going to take advantage of what you thought was a tendency. And I'm hoping that that's what Toronto can do to Hamilton this week on offense. All right, JB, one thing you want to see. What are you looking for in this game? Uh, Sacks. Uh, I thought that we would have more sacks as a team. Um, I, I want to see at least three. I think we have the talent. I think Hamilton has the offensive line issues. Uh, I want to see three sacks. That's a pretty good one. And I do think they've been playing well. Like the defensive line has played well, but yeah, it hasn't no, turned into statistics, right? They haven't, they've, there've been pressures. There have been some knockdowns, but it hasn't shown up in the, in the sack column uh, because they've often only been sending three, but how are you going to get those sacks though? Like, do you want to see that from that three man rush or do you want to see it from heat getting sent? Yeah, right. I, I, I would like to see um, more heat. I think that, um, you know, r- in not not in the red zone um but i i do think like in the middle of the field uh i'd like to see you know you know bring that secondary heat um you know send some linebackers uh maybe mwamba a gap uh he's a big strong guy he's coming through that a gap it's going to be a problem if they're not looking for that you know more more uh more games more twists uh i would like to see uh, a little expansion of our of our uh uh, our blitz packages um, because I, th- I think that is the weakness of that team. And I think that you can, that we should definitely um, come at it uh, w- within reason. I'm not looking for some kind of, you know, because I hate when teams bring heat, you know, 70% of the time it's like, then it's not heat anymore. Um, you know, I want to bring it, you know, four times a game is what I want. And those four times you get a sack strategic use of of blitz timing and stuff yeah not because if you if you bring it over and over and over and over again then guys just pick it up it's just it's just a natural tendency i think i think you you play head up and then you pick your spots the one thing i want to see this week are home run balls i would like to see a couple of those just absolute bombs whether it's down the sideline whether it's down the middle of the field i don't care i want to see arbuckle drop back pause get great pass protection and just unload throw as far as he can throw it hit a receiver in stride and waltz into the end zone because one fear i have with this offense is that a lot of it takes place 15 yards and under there's a lot of short stuff there's a lot of quick outs there's a lot of slants Uh, they've had a lot of use of receiver screens we've seen we refer to it as the ricky collins jr screen which is like a jailbreak screen basically there's a ton of that stuff that is in tight and because those are the those are the the plays that Arbuckle does well. He does RPOs very well, and those are the routes you get out of RPOs. So you kind of add that to the short passing plays that we otherwise see schemed in there. I want to see them open it up, and I want teams to, going into next week and going down the road, I want teams to have to back up. I don't want them creeping in like I feel they're starting to now. And so... I know Coach Dinwiddie's strategy sometimes is to is to bring the, the offense in tight so that you can take advantage of those double moves. But I just want to see one deep shot home run ball. And I know we don't quite have the right receivers to do it, but I still want to see it take place with the guys that are out there. I want to see Eric Rogers on a on a go route or seam or a or, or a deep post. I, w- I want to see someone flying down the sideline, Devaris, if he's if he's healthy, without it having to be a double move, but just a as I said, drop back and unleash it. And if we can connect on a couple of those, I think that will uh, pay dividends down the road. I think that's just going to do wonders for opening up the middle of the field. So that's one thing I want to see on Labor Day. Score predictions, JB, you are up first. (laughs) What do you see happening Um, on Labor Day Monday? I I think that much like the Winnipeg back-to-back, I think that we win at home against Hamilton. I, I don't think we went on the road, especially 
down a couple of guys, even if they're back, they haven't been able to practice. Um, I see Hamilton winning this game 28-17. A pretty big margin, 11-point victory, him. Eh? Well, I, I think I think there's going to be some turnovers. I think that that this team is 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 built to turn the ball over. Um and I think when you're on the road, and I know it's not going to be packed, but it's going to be loud. Um, you know, I, I think that you're going to get some turnovers. And, uh, you know, I think that Hamilton is, look, Hamilton is a very good team and, and they're getting their swagger back. Um, I think that if we were 100% healthy and all hands on board, um, I'd probably choose differently. But I, I don't think uh, an Argos team missing a couple of starters uh, is going to get it done this week. I feel a little bit more optimistic. I am a little bit rattled by the potential loss of three offensive starters. It's not going to impact the defense, though, and I think this defense is going to stun Hamilton. The Toronto defense is better than the Winnipeg defense, and it's better than the Saskatchewan defense. I feel quite confident in that. And those defenses completely limited Hamilton, albeit with a different quarterback, I know. But Montreal's defense, I don't think there's much, there's nothing special about them. I don't think Montreal's defense is very good. And even still, it wasn't like Hamilton was running up and down the field. I think the Toronto defense is going to punch them in the mouth. I think that's going to actually create turnovers the other way. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the Argos get their first defensive points of the year either on a scoop and score or on an interception return. So I see Toronto getting out in front uh, with a bit of a lead. That will take a little bit of the pressure off the offense, and then they can play a little bit more conservatively. I think Hamilton sort of comes roaring back, but not in time. I see this as a 24-21 win for the Argonauts. Well, that will just about do it for us on this edition of the X's and Argos podcast. If you get a chance, please take a moment to write us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Take a moment to rate And subscribe if you already haven't, because the nice thing about subscribing to a podcast is it shows up right there on your phone. It lets you know when there are new episodes, so you make sure you don't miss any of them. For JB, my name is Ben Grant saying so long, and may all your pre-snap reads be good ones. I'll see ya. Go Toronto Argos, go, go, go. Pull together, fight the foe, foe, foe.